actual forecast. Um, you know, if we have if we have these jet stream maximas like that, that can really do a lot to the wind shear values that you start seeing in the models. Um, a lot of times you'll see things like the supercell composite parameter, sig tor parameter, be completely maxed out, and everybody gets all excited. Well, if you look at the background data, it's really an artifact of all this extra wind shear that's thrown in there by the model. Uh, but at the same time, think about it the other way. If a model is trying to develop all these thunderstorms, that can do a lot to instability. If the model thinks all this instability is being taken away by these thunderstorms that don't exist, you might think that the instability forecast is weaker, you might not have severe storms, if you don't actually take a look at the data and see what the model is doing. So those are, those are things to look at. Again, you'll see things like those weird uh, vertical motion maximas and, and stuff like that, but it, it's usually pretty apparent when that's, when that's happening in the model. All right, so now we'll jump into ensembles. To me, ensembles are the way of the future. Um, Everything, you know, a lot of things are starting to go to ensembles. The purpose of an ensemble is to kind of see what all the different potential forecasts that are out there based on um, variability in, in the initial observation. So we talked about just how critical observations are to, to a model forecast. Well, there can be differences in how, you know, how observations are obtained. You know, when you send a weather balloon up, uh, you know, it, it goes up, it goes up in Denver, but it lands somewhere way out hundreds of miles east. So there's there's some variability in how data like that is is interpreted. So these ensembles are kind of an attempt to figure out what other outcomes there are if the observations are just a little bit different. So here's just some notable ensembles. Uh, you have the GEFS, the SREF, the Storm Prediction Center. The ENS, which comes from the European uh, Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, and the GFPL, they do a lot of hurricane modeling. Uh, so again, you see here a list of members. So each of those members is going to have slightly different options inside of it. So this model is going to run with one set of conditions. This model runs as another set. And I'll have some better definition of that here in a little bit. So basically, here's the... Uh, Here's the, four, uh, the initial conditions, and there's, there's some variability in what those actually were. You know, was it really 25 degrees at the surface at this point? Was it, was it 22? Was it 29? And, you know, you know that the forecast should probably land somewhere in here, just by climatology. But then you get this big wide range of solutions from your ensembles, and then you kind of have a deterministic or a mean forecast that's kind of the average of all those. So this is this kind of puts some quantification to uh, to what ensembles do. This is from the GFDL. Again, this is the geophysics lab. They run a ton of hurricane stuff. So they have their main forecast, which is what they run all the time. Well, what the ensembles do, uh, for example, this this is one member here. So this increases the this model runs with an increased observation of wind. So it says, okay, what if the hurricane is actually 10% stronger than what we analyzed it at. Uh, it also takes the wind radius to be, to be a little bit larger. So again, this is changing what it thought the initial observations were, just in case the initial observations weren't quite correct. Uh, and again, we see this model does the same thing in the opposite. It says, okay, what if the hurricane's actually a little bit weaker than what we, what we sampled? And you see the same thing. This, this changes the moisture. Uh, this changes the sea surface temperature. So all these models go through and run uh, different, uh, with different initial conditions just to kind of uh, improve on that variability. And then, of course, we have models that actually run with some different physics calculations that, um, that try to compute a different method. So this is an example from a an ensemble forecast. So this is from the SPC. They're what they call the plume viewer from the SREF model. So this is just a, a total snow accumulation forecast a few weeks back. We have a 0.65 to 10.4 inch range in solutions. So obviously that's that's the difference between no kind of watch warning or anything to you know a, a 
winter storm warning or heavy snow warning for you know, 10 inches of snow. So all these are different, different values here, uh, what the model thinks. So we kind of see the mean is actually about five inches. I'm not sure what actually verified here, but we can see just how much variability there can be from changing those initial conditions just a little bit. It really shows just how important the initial observations are. So this is kind of a similar idea here. This is a probability map. And I really encourage chasers to start looking at this as we get into severe weather season. So this is the probability of Cape uh, being greater than 500 joules per kilogram. So we see here these 70s and 80s, 90s. That is a 70% chance or 70% of the forecast that were generated. Again, we had all those ensembles. 70% of them said there was going to be more than 500, or, yeah, more than 500 K. Now, a lot of times, you'll start seeing the, you know, I've done this many times myself. You go, the 84-hour dam finally comes into range for your forecast, especially early in the year. Finally comes into range, has 70-degree dew points over central Oklahoma, and you think it's going to be a great chase. Well, you take a look at the SREF here. The SREF may say only 10% of the models have the dew point getting above it. Know, above 65. And then as the NAM forecast starts to go on, you see the dew point values start to drop. So the SREF has always been really good to me in, uh, in terms of figuring out what's actually going to happen and figuring out the best solution. We'll use the SREF a little bit later on in our real data case that we're going to talk about. So this is, this is the real data case right now, actually. Uh, so which model is right? So a lot of times, especially in dynamic situations, you're going to have a ton of different model uh, outputs. And it's kind of your job to figure out which models you like. Uh, you know, not, just, not just which one looks the coolest, which one gives me the most snow or the biggest severe weather outbreak, but being objective in figuring out what's going to happen. Again, the first step here is really which model is handling the initial conditions best. So take a look at observations, look at a surface map, look at an upper air map. Uh, is the trough in the same spot? Is the, you know, the shore wave in the same spot? Really critical to beginning a forecast of any type. A lot of times I'll go through and I'll compare, this, uh, compare the same fields in, in both models. So I'll see, okay, what do, what do 500 heights look like? And you can kind of compare those and see where the models start to diverge and what the differences are. And we'll do that here in a little bit. So again, then you have to discern which model is the most likely. Or maybe you want to use a blend of all the models. You don't really know, you want to kind of blend them together. You can look at ensembles, see where the mean is, and see if there's any changes with time to see if the model is trending one different way. So here, this is, again, this is real data. This is the big blizzard that's heading up into the northeast. So this is from a zero Z run two nights ago. Uh, total accumulated snow, NAM on the left, GFS on the right. So the NAM is maxed out. The color bars here on my website, 50 inches. So it's somewhere above 50 inches. GFS is, oh, you know, maybe, maybe 20, 25. Uh, this star here is, keep that area in mind, we're going to look at a, we're going to look at an SREF, the ensemble forecast for that point in a little bit. So again, NAM versus GFS, big difference. Now I want to go see why. So this is a, slightly cut off, but this is a NAM uh, forecast of the 250 millibar winds. So we see this pretty strong uh, jet streak here on the back side, uh, upstream there. And when you get these strong jet max on kind of upstream on the back side of the trough, they usually suggest that the system is going to dig pretty deep and it's, it's going to continue, this trough's going to continue to dig further south. Again, this is a, this is a 48 hour forecast. Now, if we look at the GFS, okay, not, not quite as dynamic, you know, still a little jet streak there, but it doesn't really, it's not as impressive as the NAM. So we would say that maybe the system won't be quite as strong won't dig quite as far south. So here's the, this is 60 hours, so this is 12 hours later from what we just saw. Again, this is still a forecast. With the base of the trough on the dam, somewhere right there where that white line is. This is where the GFS is. So we looked at that data and we said, okay, the GFS has a stronger, the GFS has a weaker system, 
The NAM has a stronger system. There's that jet streak on the back side. We can kind of suggest that it's going to be a little stronger. It's going to dig a little bit further south. And we see that continue to be reflected in the forecast uh, based, on, based on that data. So again, GFS a little bit uh, further north. Here's the, here's the NAM forecast. We have, uh, this is 850 millibar temps. We can see some really strong temperature gradients up there, suggesting that it's a pretty powerful storm. It's, it's pretty strong. When we look at the, the GFS, we really don't see, I mean, there's not really a sharp temperature contrast in here where you have really strong uh, differential thermal ejection. So nothing really uh, is quite as impressive on the, on the GFS. Now if we go look at a forecast for the, the surface low, again, that's all reflected. We said from the beginning of the forecast that it looked like the, the NAM was a little bit stronger. And again, we see this big 958 surface low on the NAM. And, you know, 964 on the, the GFS. Again, NAM stronger. It's pulling, it's pulling in all this colder air from up north. The GFS not quite as strong. Temperature's a little bit warmer. And these are things that we can already start to see. Wow, you know, the NAM is stronger. That may be why it's producing more snow. Does that mean it's right? Not, not quite, but again, it's something to consider. And now you know why the models were different on their forecasts. So this is uh, the short range ensemble forecast for um, Bar Harbor, Maine, which is where that circle or the star was. Here's the operational name of the image I showed you in the first case, 77 <coughs> inches. You can see that is a significant outlier. And we've went through now, and now we know why. It, it's, it has a much stronger system. It digs further south. So we can kind of see now why you know, the operational NAM might not be something we really need to worry about. Uh, we can you know, throw it out or kind of blend it in. OK, so we have a mean here. The average is 30.4 inches. You know, kind of right in the middle, you can see the ensemble is really clustered in that area. So that's kind of a blend, you know, a little bit more than the, than the GFS, so maybe a good idea. And this is uh, this is what the NWS is actually forecasting. So this is their forecast database. So they have 26 inches up there in the northeast. Uh, there's probably a little bit more that's going to fall after this period. We're probably about 30. But you can see that, you know, they, they use the blend kind of the models. They use the S mean. When you're really in doubt, when you have a huge forecast variance like that, there's no problem with taking a mean, especially in, in, in situations like this. And of course, with time, those differences are going to start to uh, resolve themselves and start to have a, a clearer forecast. But when you have to have a number out there, you have to have a forecast, you're on the East Coast, you need to leave for a chase, it takes a couple days to get out here, you may have to look at a mean and say, okay, well, I think you know, the dry line may set up here instead of over here. So again, taking an average, looking at all the models, always a good thing to do. So we will uh, kind of close out here with the almighty hero that we talked about. So ECMWF, again, we talked about it, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. The first thing I want to point out is the actual model data that you see is not ECMWS. That's just the name of the organization that runs the model. So just, just clear that up. The actual uh, NWP, the Numerical Weather Prediction Model that you see is called the HRES. That's whatever they named it. It's really the same idea as the worst here that's, you know, in America. It's, it's a thing that computes a forecast. That's, that's really what it is, but it's not open source. You can't go download it. You can't get access to it. Uh, but it's really the same idea. Now, the Europeans, they spend, you know, $40 million a year on, on human brain power to, to write all this code and do everything. Uh, they've developed what they call the integrated forecast system. It's a system that does everything all in, all in one process. So it takes in all the data, it computes a forecast, and then it spits out a readable data. Now here, we have three different processes for that. We have three different applications that we have to use. We talked about data assimilation. The Europeans have an incredible data assimilation system. They take in a lot of the same observations, but they've developed some really complex algorithms and statistics to kind of know uh, what the best set of observations are going to be. 
Um, so this is one reason for kind of that notion of superiority. Again, we're doing a lot better with data assimilation here in the US. The GFS has got a big upgrade on its data assimilation. But this is kind of one notion of superiority that ECMWF gets just because of that data. So this is a famous image that everybody remembers. This is when the Euro became popular, started being on national broadcast news all the time afterwards uh, for Hurricane Sandy. So again, these are, these are ensemble plots, the GEFS and uh, the Global Ensemble Forecast System, and the, which is an American product, and then the European. From the start, the European said, this thing is going to curve back towards land. It's almost all the European ensemble members said it's coming back towards land, while the GFS says, nope, going off to sea. We get a little bit closer, okay, European still, yep, it's coming back. GFS, okay, we got a few members coming over here. So again, each of those members is, is doing something a little bit different with the forecast. It's, uh, you know, some different options, some different physics. That's why you're getting slightly different forecasts. We get uh, even closer. Okay, now we got a few more GFS members coming. And then finally, everything pretty much says, with the exception of a few, everything says, okay, it's coming back to land. And obviously, the NHC hurricane track is, is right up through there by this time we had some pretty good prediction. Um, so, I mean, there's been some improvements, some recent events uh, by the the GFS, I mean, you can't take one event and say GFS did better than the Euro, let's use it only, and the same is true in the other case. So another thing here at the GFS that, that kind of sticks out to me as maybe a notion for, for superiority is the GFS has 64 vertical levels in it. Now, we talked about uh, grid spacing and on a horizontal scale, how, how that can vary. Uh, but obviously, a forecast has to be computed vertically also. Uh, the GFS computes a forecast at 64 vertical levels. Uh, the Euro just recently got an upgrade. Now it's producing a forecast at 137 different levels vertically through the atmosphere. I'll put this on a, on a chart here in a bit, but um, even just thinking about it, when you start to have these really shallow fronts, a lot of times you'll see uh, especially in the fall, these cold fronts out in the plains that will rush south. You know, the NAM and the you know, GFS, they may be you know, 10, 12 hours behind on the cold front, but the Europeans sometimes handle those frontal boundaries better, those shallow fronts, because it has that vertical resolution. Again, this is another potential reason for maybe a better forecast by, uh, by the European. So this is, I don't actually have a a graph here of their new 137 levels. This is back when they had 91 vertical levels. But you can still see here, especially when you get here in the, you know, the mid troposphere, there's really a big difference there in how many forecasts are computed by the European versus the GFS. Um, again, you know, that can have big implications on all these thermal gradients that are really key to tracking short waves and upper level energy, so that, that can make a difference. Um, but again, you know, vertical resolution increase uh, does impact forecast time. That may be some of the reason why the GF or the European only runs twice a day. Uh, I don't know the reason behind that, but they're doing a lot of intensive stuff uh, with their computing. So this is just kind of a, a skill score that um, you know, modelers use, and really it just shows how well the model performs in respect to, to climatology. Now, this isn't saying any one particular event, uh, so, so don't take it like that. But we can see here that you know, all through last year, the, you know, the European had, had a better forecast score than the GFS, and they stayed pretty much the same distance apart. Obviously, there's times in here, July, August, when the air is not really moved, and you have these high-pressure systems that just sit there. That uh, you know, model forecast score during that time is, is never too good, uh, but you can see the European is you know, pretty often ahead of us. Now, let's jump ahead and look at what's happened since the GFS got its upgrade. Again, we see you know, there's times when they're really far apart, but there's also times when the GFS and the Euro do comparably well in a forecast. So, 
you know, it's still to be determined just how, you know, what these upgrades are going to be. And every day, I mean, um, there's brilliant scientists here in America working on that kind of stuff every day to, to bump up data simulation, to improve models. Um, they're about to get a huge supercomputing upgrade here. So uh, we're doing a lot. There's a lot of forward progress. Um, so it's just a continuous battle here to become better. I mean, the, the U.S. leads in high-resolution models. Uh, you know, we have all these high-resolution models that aren't found anywhere else. But this is one area of focus right now, building these better long-term forecasts and trying to add some reliability to those. So again, here, this is uh, you know, part of the integrated forecast system. There's hundreds of pages of online documentation of these crazy complex algorithms and everything that they're using. But the main point I want to suggest here is that many of the same intricacies that exist in the European model also exist in American models. Um, so for that reason, you shouldn't take a GFS forecast and throw it away because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look as nice or you just automatically think it's wrong. Just from everything we've talked about in this presentation, you should take every forecast, be objective with it, see why there's a difference in the model, and see if you can track that back to maybe an observation error or just handling of, of portions of a system that handles a short wave different. Uh, but just determine which forecast makes the most sense uh, for every scenario. And that's all I have. Uh, I covered a lot. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything?